Bobby Hundred's book is coming out. Uh, are you guys excited? As excited as I am, I'm very excited. Actually, I want to check it out. We don't really get many. Um, most of the information or most of the kind of real crucial information, the ones that's really going to give the kids an understanding of where the scene has, or where the scene has come, and where it's kind of gone, and where it's going to in streetwear. We don't really have many books out there that really do a good job of it, right? So I think this effort by Bobby Hundreds is really commendable. I really commend him for doing so. But again, I'm not surprised because he's somebody that's always been... I don't, I've don't. i always got the impression he was going to lead himself to get to his prime point. He did that big documentary that... I don't know. I didn't actually watch it. Did you guys watch it? The Streetway documentary? He did that a while back ago. And he kind of... It seemed like he's kind of going more into this. He's kind of relaxed. It seems like he's relaxed. Um, Kind of going back to the... Tony Hawk interview recently that I've, I listened to where, he's, where he kind of he kind of was very self-reflective and kind of was a, understanding and accepting that he's never going to be cool so he kind of occupied another position now and I guess probably hundreds has kind of done the same thing he's realized he's never going to be the cool guy he's always going to be the kind of you know kind of corny appealing to the kind of cheesy fan base but that's a fan base that he still loves and appreciates which I think is awesome I, I think that's a cool thing about him he hasn't uh, disowned his fans. I think a lot of cool guys street where people would be annoyed if they had fans like Bobby Hundreds and they'd purposely try and pivot their brand away from those kind of kids. But Bobby Hundreds really leaned into it and kind of given them what they want for the most part. And for that, for that, he has a loyal fan base of kids who you know you don't have to see when they do those uh, sample sale kind of like grab bag things that they do in LA. Sometimes the queues are insane. Um, they still sell out of limited edition pieces that they have. They still have a course fan base of kids that are just going to keep buying their stuff. And the fact that they have it in malls now, it just opens up to a whole different kind of client base and consumer base of kids who probably don't have access to streetwear stores locally. I'd imagine so, right? I'd imagine if, like, even just living here in Stratford, I'd imagine if they open up a little, if they open up a streetwear focused store in Stratford that sold a, a wide range of brands, or even kind of, even if they end up selling tier C brands, right? Let's say Supreme is tier A, hundreds is tier B, and this is a tier C brands. If they sold tier C brands in a shop somewhere in Stratford Westfield, they would do they would do amazingly well. And those kids and those brands would end up having fans for life because that was their first access to those kind of brands. Because you only have to look at a Westfield to see the brands in there, right? They've got Uniqlo, H and M, JD Sports, Top Shop, and that. Like that, you know. There's no, you know, those guys are no competition to like a really well put together streetwear brand that has some kind of great brand image, has a good legacy behind it, has a good product range you know, it would kill it. So I understand their, their their idea of going into the malls, but I know for some of us in the scene of some of the purist types, it was kind of a bit of a, an RIP sign, a bit of a death symbol that they were kind of going to go under. But again, I appreciate his um, courage to do that. I appreciate the business acumen. I appreciate the fact that he did it in spite of the fact that he'd probably be looked at as a sellout by his peers. And in general, look what he's got him, right? He's got like a 20 plus year career in streetwear, I think, or something along those lines. Stupid, right? So he's been able to live He's been able to turn his lifestyle into a business, um, um, a la what you know the famous Aaron Bondarov quote, and de- doing it on his own terms, right? Like it's it's an amazing, and the amount of people that have kind of spawned out of that the hundreds, because I've always think that's a good marker. Same with Supreme, the same with Rockefeller, um, and all the other great organization labels out there. It's not necessarily about the core people; it's about what happens uh, what happens to the people around it, and. The hundreds have spawned so many different careers of people, right? From Scott Hill to the other interns and assistants. So even that girl that was, I forgot the girl's name. That one I was always on there. People fancy, like loads of people have kind of spawned from that bloody store. The, the what you call it, Tyler, the creator, like all the, all the, all the future crew, the Supreme crew. There's a list of brands from half to a New York thing to, you know, to whatever else you may name it. So he's really done a good job of cultivating that community. So anyway, enough of me, uh, you know, going down on him. Uh, Bobby Hundreds has a new book out called This Is Not A T-Shirt. It's a bit of a memoir based on his life, but again, centered around uh, streetwear. A quick interview here on Hypebeast that kind of goes through it. Um, let's read a couple of the questions and answers and kind of you know, expand on a little bit of it as we go along. So interview Hypebeast, again, I'll, I'll link in the show notes for you guys to check out. So the question here is, what triggered you to write This Is Not A T-Shirt? Were there specific instances in your life that motivated you to do what you... to, to to do motivated you or did you want to write a book like this along all along since you started hundreds uh, bobby hundreds streetwear is fertile entrepreneurial grounds for a generation of youth who are um attuned to better branding social media marketing yet most of the popular business literature out there highlights a specific kind of success story embellishes but embellished by a billion dollar valuation the celebrity founders i wanted to tell an honest street story which is very true one which winnings 
and failure are less important than thriving and survival, which is honestly the best thing. I think that's maybe maybe the best marker of a successful streetwear brand. You don't really, I don't think anyone should get in it to become, you know, Nick Tershay and buying Blue Lamborghini and Tiffany Blue Lamborghini, which is fair and cool. But I think that's his lane. That's something he's always been into. Very flashy dude, or is what it is. Or be a Ben Baller. Those guys are the way they are. They've always been like that. Trust me, I followed the scene for a while. They've never changed, right? They've always been fucking, you know, cash. Uh, splurges and stuff and living that l- nice life which you can do but I think it should be about the idea of like you know you're in this scene you you love the product you start getting curious you start going to stores you want to deconstruct an item that you have and you want to add your own voice you want to find you want to make something that's missing in the scene and then if you are able to cultivate a community you know 1000 true fans through Kevin Kelly right and, and kind of grow from there and somehow sustain a career forever where you don't have to work a normal job again. That is the absolute dream, right? Because most streetwear dudes have to work like regular, regular jobs, nine to fives, work in a store, marketing agency, branding, whatever it may be. So you're always working at the behest of other people's dreams, right? You're always having to actualize someone else's passion, someone else's goals. So to do it for yourself must be, wow, what a great feeling. So just the fact that you're surviving and thriving, especially in the economy, especially in the clothing industry, right? No one needs another t-shirt. No one needs another pair of jeans. No one needs another hoodie. No one needs another sneaker. So if you just do it, that's a big deal. So yeah, prayer to him. Uh, sure, there's the dose of streetwear history stuff. And you also learn about Ben and Ben and I built the hundreds. But this book is really about making something you're proud of. Connecting with other people through your purpose, through your process, sorry. And most importantly, helping them to meet each other. Let's tell a better business anecdote. One that acknowledges the hard lessons and the co- communal aspects at which the glitz and glam, which is very true, right? Because a lot of the entrepreneurial stories you hear, especially the ones that you hear in self-help books, are mostly based around survivor bias, right? Just because that person survived and was able to kind of get through what they got through doesn't, doesn't necessarily mean you will too. So in some respects, this story that he's telling in this memoir is maybe going to resonate more to kids because it doesn't necessarily mean when you start a brand, you're going to have that brand forever. I think that's something a lot of kids don't really realize. When you start a t-shirt brand or whatever it may be, or cut and sew brand, the idea is just to kind of try it out and become a creator as opposed to a consumer, right? Because we're all expert consumers. We know where to buy things. We know who made what. We know when this was launched, where it was launched, how limited it is. We all know that we have the knowledge. But to get from that place to suddenly making your own t-shirt, from realizing that maybe what's works on a PSD file on your screen doesn't necessarily work on a shirt, um, understanding fabrication, understanding application, understanding finishing, distribution, marketing, all these other aspects of a business, right? There's a really stuff that you only learn once you make one t-shirt, once you make a jumper, a long sleeve, a hoodie, a pair of socks. And then the more you do that, the more you start to realize the thing that you're actually passionate about, right? You'll start to lean into some of some things that you like. And I think that's the that's the probably the benefit of making a brand. It's similar to like probably putting a zine out. It's less about you having your magazine and more so about contributing to the scene that you felt has given you so much. You want to give something back. And in the process, you might find a little passion. You might discover that, you know what, I actually like um, the reaching out to advertisers and finding brand sponsors or marketing opportunities for to make some money on the thing. Or I might like the photography side. I might like the writing side. I might like the... Uh, the artwork or the creative design side this that's the whole point of making a brand less so about the actual brand and more so about where that will lead you in the end and sometimes just about the story too right to tell your friends oh yeah i used to have a brand back in the day and have like 30 boxes in your house that you haven't sold still still there for them to check out right it's all good um second question so much of what you preach about streetwear is centered and around community what can readers of this book learn about the importance of streetwear's role in the building of a good community? Yes, streetwear is about people of a product, the media and the marketplace often get it confused, attributing streetwear success disproportionately to high ticket items and long lines. Don't agree. Long lines I do agree with though, because I think part of my community was based around the long lines, right? Going to buy a certain item, hanging out in the queues and actually building a community. There wasn't many resellers then. If they were, they usually got their stuff ahead of the time, be, you know, days before, maybe after the store closed, they kind of worked out some deal with the shop owners and standard thing that used to happen but there wasn't really a, a lot of resellers back in when i kind of got involved in street which made the community thing a lot easier to deal with and we only had forums we didn't really have facebook groups so it was quite personable it was hard to get on blah 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 but that was the thing that i kind of resonated with a lot because by and large being into streetwear means automatically people that you're going to meet are going to be into music art graffiti uh design architecture interior design traveling uh subcultures like skateboarding and stuff like or even 
MMA. I got into that through streetwear, oddly enough. Loads of things that you kind of get into just through are just going to be centered around that umbrella of streetwear, which is kind of the amazing part of it. So nowadays, again, I think because of the prevalence of StockX and because of, because of the prevalence of Supreme and other tier zero brands and whatever Nike are putting out with the collaboration and Yeezys and stuff, that's kind of distorted the field. But there's always that's always existed. But the the core tenet of street has always been about that community side of it, right? It's about you finding this brand that no one else knows about and dig, you know, and kind of making it popular or hiding the label or not letting people know where you bought it from. And then eventually it gets out and everyone knows that you're the first person to kind of put them on. That was what street was about, that kind of one-upmanship. And now it's turned into just like, you know, it's either dudes wearing everything that's expensive at one go or it's the fact that you're flipping everything and not wearing anything or it's just an absolute um what's the thing called cynical approach to everything that's out which i don't agree with as well right this whole oh the yesterday years were so much better no man this is probably the best era we're living in ever right you could start a brand literally on off your phone right now if you wanted to um which is amazing some some parts amazing parts scary but that idea that you could just initially get a brand now and print it without you investing any of your own money into it is flipping incredible um it continues but it's just but it's but if it's just uh, about resale value the sophisticated customer will graduate to more profitable ventures like flipping art and real estate instead they are drawn to street because they identify with their dynamic personalities behind the brands and find each other in the process whether in the comments at a party or even one of those crazy lineups yeah those parties are so cool the launch ones i love them all the time now now they make me cringe they make me throw up my mouth because they're full of too many tryhards but back then you're all trying hard at the same time you know you're all young you're all just stupid and just trying to put your best foot forward but nowadays you know you've got people in their 40s still trying to be cool guy hit streetwear dudes which is really sad and then you have the 18 year olds and they're kind of battling for the same jobs it's like someone needs to kind of give way it either needs to be the kids going and making their own scene or it needs to be the old guys getting the fuck out but that's never gonna happen is it um in my book, I talk about how kids uh, sleep on the sidewalk for days only to buy a single T-shirt. It's not about my, it's not about it's not about the clothing. It's about connecting, and that's very true, right? Because I bought I tell a story all the time. I bought a baby gate seller tape after queuing up for maybe a day and a half, right? And everyone in the queue rinsing the complete shop that I wanted, right? Because Baby Ape, back in the day, the the nowhere store, they used to only have a particular amount of items they used to come in through the drop. Only a num only a certain quantity would come in, like a particular Averex jacket, a particular kind of leather jacket, or a down jacket, or a long sleeve, or a hoodie. And by the time the the main the main people in the front of the queue got it got there, most of it was gone because they already had an inside info for the store manager about how many pieces were coming in line, so they might pull in their friends to get some other stuff to resell. So by the time we got in there, there was nothing left. We had to buy sellotape, and I bought sellotape. That's how much I was connected to Baby Ape. I love the brand so much that I actually bought sellotape for twenty pounds or twenty five quid or something. It was insane. Um, but yeah, this whole interview is available now on Hypebeast. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but definitely check it out. I'm definitely going to read the book. When I get the book, I'm going to do a review of it, actually. Um, I'm a big fan of Bobby Hundreds. I think he's always got some interesting things to say. So it'd be cool to see how he's been able to kind of surmise his experience in the streetwear industry. But again, I'll put the link in the show notes for you guys to check out. But the title of the article is Bobby Hundreds' book is This Is Not Streetwear. This Is Not a T-Shirt, sorry. It's a really, it's a, really a guide to cultivating communities. It's on Hypebeast now, but I'll link it to show if you can check out. And his book is available now. This is not a t-shirt. I think it's coming out June 22nd or something like that, right? When's it coming out here? Let's scroll down and check here. His book is going to be out on June 25th. I'm sure there's going to be some activations for it too, right? I'm pretty sure. Anyone in the comments, let me know if there's activations for it. You're probably going to do some speaking tours. Hopefully, he comes to London and does something here too, even though there's nothing to come down here for. You know, there's only sneaker sites, sneaker stores, like sneakers and stuff and stuff around or end clothing. It's not really a dedicated streetwear store or scene here anymore. It feels like most of the kids in London are really into fashion as opposed to streetwear. But again, it would be cool to see what he does if he does end up coming to London. But I recommend you check it out. Out June 25th. This is not a t-shirt by Bobby Hundreds. It should be a cool.